Clarita here, and I've got a new sponsor, DistroKid. If you want to release your music into the world, DistroKid's the easiest way to get your music into all the major streaming platforms, unlimited uploads, and keep 100% of your royalties. And because you're a Design Freaks listener, you get 30% off. Go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Design Freaks. DistroKid. anything. This is fun. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Design Freaks podcast. My name's Clarita. I am your host and I am a graphic designer in Seattle. I like to talk about record covers and talk to designers. And here we go with episode 71. That is enough of that. I have to put my glasses on. I just wanted to see what that would be like. <laughs> yeah, so it's mid-October. Naturally, it's mid-October, so naturally I'm going to keep going with my spooky shows. So far, I've done Rain and Blood by Slayer. Um, check that out if you haven't. And then my last episode, I got to interview Eloise Lee from Dark Entries Records. So I've always been so curious about reissue design and especially that label that works so hard to uh, bring us these lost treasures. I really am um, so stoked I got to talk to her and bring that to you. At this point, I wanted to do something a little bit different, but still creepy. The The most obvious thing would be uh, metal covers to keep going with that because there's really scary ones. There's gore and actual body parts and crazy stories, but there's a different kind of creepiness that sticks with me even more. We're going to talk about an example. So this record has been on my list since the beginning, but also, um, and by the way, it's my five-year anniversary on Halloween this year. So five years ago, this was on my list. It's on a bunch of worst album covers of all times, creepiest, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I wasn't sure there'd be much of a story. Oh, there is. Buckle up everyone, because today we're going to be talking about the Leuven Brothers. Satan is real. Before I get into all of that, um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please share with other vinyl and design freaks and leave a five-star iTunes review. Subscribe to my YouTube, uh, Design Freaks there. Um, and there's a link in the show notes. You can find everything at designfreakspodcast.com. I'm at underscore designfreakspodcast on Instagram. Everything is in the old link tree. And yeah, I can't believe this show is free. It's not free to produce. So if you've learned anything or enjoy the show, please consider uh, my Venmo is at designfreaks. And there's a link in the show notes and a support button on my website, designfreakspodcast.com. You can either donate, you can become a Patreon member. Special thank you to Matt Hogan. Thank you for your support. I love saying Hogan. Okay, so I've got some great interviews coming up and some other new minisodes too. So there's nothing creepier, in my opinion, than religion, and especially one that believes in a literal devil or demon. So just a little bit about me. I grew up in Texas. I did grow up in the Baptist church until I was old, you know, a teenager and was like, no thanks. Um, but <laughs> make me. Um, but yeah, they, it's a religion that likes to scare you. Spooky billboards and weird, yeah, imagery everywhere to try to get everyone to fly straight or to align with their morals. But um so not only that, but I'm also part Mexican. So I also grew up not only with the fire and brimstone of the Baptist church, but also like the superstition and the ooey kukui and don't go over. There's witches in the trees, kids. And, you know, the stuff that stays with you, like even while I was researching this, I was like, ooh, I've said the word Satan so many times. I hope I don't Beetlejuice. Like that was just a thought for a second. Like it never leaves you. Um, that you might actually Beetlejuice the devil into your apartment. <laughs> uh, 
uh, not a rational thought, but a thought nonetheless. Um, so yeah, so there's something really, to me, spooky about these types of didactic kind of gospel records. Satan lied to me, Satan lied to me, when he said he'd be my friend all I'd ever need. Let's go on this journey, learn about the Leuven Brothers, this album, try to see if Satan is indeed real. The sources are in the show notes including several articles um, that I referenced. And then also special thanks to the podcast Cocaine and Rhinestones. Their episode called The Leuven Brothers Running Wild was especially helpful. There's also a whole book. I'll talk about that later. Um, I have not read it, but uh, if you want to know even more about these guys, uh, definitely check that out. So first, let's talk a little bit about the Leuven Bros before we get into Satan is Real, because it's There's a little background you need. So they're an American country vocal harmony duet. Brothers Ira and Charlie Loudermilk. They grew up in Sand Mountain region of Alabama on a cotton farm in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Boy, I would not be welcome there. Um, Another thing I immediately think is they grew up what is known as dirt poor. Um, Probably in a way none of us now can even imagine. Um, so they developed their harmony style in the church. They grew up singing in the Baptist church and it's called the sacred harp tradition. And, um, I listened to some of that sacred harp and it's, although Charlie says you cannot capture it with a microphone, which is really eerie. Um, it is spooky. There's no instruments. It's just all vocals and it's people standing in a circle and one person in the middle and just harmonizing and the harp is the vocal cords of everybody in the room. Anyway, Charlie and Ira's professional career began after winning a talent contest by singing there's a hole in the bottom of the sea. And that's a hard song. It's one of those, like, there's a frog and a log and a hole in the bottom. Of, you know, it's like keeps building. Um, so they had a lot of talent. They toured a bunch in the 40s with their gospel music. At some point, they did change their name to Leuven Brothers to try to, I think they thought people were having a hard time remembering their last name. It was too long. And um, from the Cocaine and Rhinestones episode, there's a special term for the type of harmony they were able to achieve. And you can only achieve this as your vocal cords sort of um, develop together with a family member singing with that family member. It's called blood harmony. It's been called otherworldly. It's eerie how they're harmony, how they're able to achieve these harmonies. Um, there's a lot more about these brothers. If you want, um, like I said, there's a whole book basically their dreams came true by just getting really good at singing together. And Charlie played guitar and Ira played mandolin. They went on the road to play their gospel music throughout the forties. And then, um, they did eventually want to branch out into secular music. So after touring in the forties, they were signed to Capitol records in 1952 This is kind of reminding me of them wanting to switch from gospel to secular music because I think in a lot of these shows they were playing, and I'll get into the cover in just a second, but a lot of these shows they were playing, they were playing with other like honky-tonk bands and people were drinking and partying and stuff. And so them getting up and singing gospel songs, that's not really what people wanted to hear. It made them feel bad about what they were doing at that moment. (laughs) It's like... How, singing about how you're going to go to hell, probably, you know, it's not fun. So it feels like you're in church. So um, they wanted to branch out. And this is making me think about uh, the skit from a show called I Think You Should Leave the Day Robert Pal- Palin's Murdered Me. Except it's the opposite, where the, they had signed to Capitol Records um, promising gospel music, but they realized on the road they needed to branch out. Um, if they wanted to succeed. So um, you you just have to watch the skit. The record label producer says people don't want gospel anymore. And then cut to bones are their money. Um, so yeah, give them something spooky. The Leuven brothers certainly did. Fast forward to 1955. 
They're finally accepted into the Grand Old Opry after trying and trying forever. They had a bunch of stops and starts in their careers, but they were generally on the rise. Fast forward to 1958. Capitol Records producer Ken Nelson kind of cut this deal where they had this studio for a week. They got to record as much as they wanted for this whole week, and they ended up recording over 20 songs. I mean, talk about Lil White Pills. What's going on here? But yeah, so they end up with so many songs, they end up with two records after all that. One was called Country Love Ballads, (laughs) and that was released. They were both released same year, 1959. Country Love Ballads, which, by the way, had a very normal cover of the two brothers sitting in front of a cornfield, which, yes, that is kind of spooky, too. But, you know, normal-ish, like straightforward typography, you know, they're dressed in their little matching outfits. And the other record they put out was the bluegrass gospel masterpiece. Satan is real. Uh, so, yeah, so these came out first. Uh, Country Love Ballads came out to crickets. Nobody cared. And then um, Satan is Real came out. I don't think that was much of a hit either. I think it got popular later. They actually, at that time, um, the only song they had on the charts was an old song, um, f- like an old single from way before. So it, it's like a weird, they had a weird trajectory around this time. If you listen to the Cocaine and Rhinestones, it had a lot to do with their relationship with Ken Nelson. There's a lot more about these brothers. Um, Ira was definitely the bones are the money part of the duet. <laughs> um, he was uh, a wild card. He was a, a loose cannon. He was a alcoholic womanizer who would smash his mandolin on stage, terrible temper, and his brother um, sort of bore the brunt of that. Um, They also got into fistfights a bunch. But anyways, getting back to this, audiences were kind of shocked by this cover. I mean, you look at this and you think it's going to be, what is this, just straight up preaching or weird musical garbage? It ends up to be absolutely fantastic. I mean... It's a decent record. It it was critically acclaimed. Um, And then the song The Christian Life was covered by the Birds on their 1968 uh, country rock album Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Great one. Um, And then Satan's Jeweled Crown was covered by Emmylou Harris on her 1975 album Elite Hotel. Uh, That song is very telling, especially when you think about Ira's life. So... It was also reissued in 2011 by Light in the Attic Records. They got the full Light in the Attic treatment with archive photos, um, new liner notes by Jessica Hundley. Shout out to Jessica. Also author of Grievous Angel, the the intimate biography of Graham Parsons. So let's look at the cover. There is no Photoshop back then, obviously. I mean, we all know this, right? But it's still crazy to think about. They went to a rock quarry set a bunch of tires on fire, placed them all around. Um, Ira took control and art directed this whole thing. Um, it was his idea to make this actual 16 foot plywood. Now, some, in some places I see it was 12 foot tall, um, shout out to Home Depot, 12 foot skeletons. (laughs) Um, but yeah, this thing, um, it's tall, but scary. It is not. If you look at this, I'm putting it up on the screen. And I'm going to describe this a little bit more. I've gotten the feedback. I'm not describing stuff enough. So I'm going to try to do that more. But they're, the two brothers are standing. It looks like Photoshop because it looks like they're, it's like a press photo of them singing. And here they are superimposed on this fiery, fire and brimstone background, all these rocks on fire. And then like it's supposed to look like hell. And then a cartoonish tall pretty cute devil. I mean, if you can zoom in on the face, it's very cute. <laughs> it's not that scary. We have the the lettering um, Satan is real over on the top right hand side. And I love this lettering a lot. It is not a font. It looks hand done, um, especially because there's um, two S's that are different but it's not a case thing. There's three A's and they're all different. So looks like it was specially drawn for the record. And then the Leuven brothers is like 
typeset and um, it's a tall sans serif. Um, anyway, designed by Ira Leuven, cover features brothers standing in a rock quarry dressed in matching spotless white suits and black ties. They really do look pretty adorable. I mean, so uh, according to Charlie, w- during this photo shoot, uh, it had started to rain. And this was uh, creating a hazard because as it was kind of drizzling, the droplets were hitting the um, kerosene tires and kind of sparking out onto the rock. And okay, this is what was said. The rocks behind them on the iconic cover nearly injured the brothers. According to the liner notes, the stones they doused in kerosene exploded while they were shooting the photos. If I were on that photo shoot, I would think going back to my superstitious upbringing, I would think maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Perhaps we are summoning some kind of energy that we shouldn't. Um, Especially if you're that as religious as these two are, I would be like, okay, time to pack it up. Time to pack up our giant devil. By the way, this would be an interesting yard Halloween decoration, um, recreating this album cover, including this tall 2D uh, adorable Satan. Anyway, uh, Ira was kind of the artist. He art directed this. He also was a painter and he was known for falling into fits of faith when he would paint portraits of the devil. And the album was one of the first recordings to become the subject of subliminal messaging myths. Satan is good. Satan is your pal. And believe I have been listening to this record a lot while I'm researching this stuff. If there's subliminal messaging, I it's it's in here. I don't know. I have, I've listened to it a lot before I even knew that that was a a rumor about this. Um, but you know, there the harmonizing old timey kind of eerie, spooky Baptist harmony style of singing. It's almost akin to, and they talk about it in that Cocaine and Rhinestones podcast, it's it's akin to like throat singing where there's some ghostly voice uh, EVP stuff happening here. And I don't know if it's just me that hears it um, or if I'm trying to hear it, but um, it's definitely uh, unsettling to me, to my ears. Anyway, getting back to the painting. So falling into fits of faith when he would paint portraits of... So wait a minute, he's painting portraits of the devil. Why? Kind of worshiping the devil. And and Ira even talks about that in the song Satan is Real. There's a part where the someone is preaching a sermon and they said, you have to accept both. Satan is real too. And hell is a real place, a place of everlasting punishment. So I like the way this is worded from one of the articles. The mix of light and darkness that filled their music was mirrored in their lives with Charlie keeping on a mostly straight path while his brother Ira gave himself over to the country music cliches of guns, drink, and divorce. It's almost like they're living out the warnings in these song lyrics from this record. Ira um, famously was shot by his third wife, Faye. Um, They actually had a party at their house and got in a fight and went into the bedroom to fight in private. That this is February of 1963. Um, while they're fighting, things get out of control, and Ira begins to strangle his wife Faye with a telephone cord. Um, absolutely terrifying, horrible. So she reached for his gun that he kept under his pillow and shot him six times. And he lived because, yes, it, not that a 22 can can't kill you, it can, but um, he got really lucky. Famously, Faye was uh, reported to have said to the police uh, that she would do it again. And she said, quote, if that son of a bitch don't die, I'll shoot him again. Not funny, but uh, don't blame her. And in August of that year, Charlie and Ira decided that the band was no longer. They... Um, Charlie had had enough, couldn't take it anymore. Ira had gone down a spiral. Wow. 
While the sound of Satan is real was not far off from the standard country and pop music in the 50s, the lyrical themes were often extremely dark and death-centric. On Satan's jeweled crown, the duo sings, This life that I've lived, so sinful and evil, drinking and running around, all the things that I do for the love of the devil, I know my reward is Satan's jewel crown. Whoa. So um, Ira survived the shooting, but two years later, while he's on tour with his new fourth wife. So each of the brothers try to branch off and do their own solo acts. And Charlie was doing pretty well on his own. Ira was not. He was trying to replace Charlie with his new wife, Anne. And um, I listened to a little bit of that. And let's just say not, not Leuven Brothers uh, quality. They are touring nonetheless. In June of 1965, they were traveling. They had just finished performing and were driving to another city at night. They came to a section of construction on Highway 70 outside of Williamsburg, Missouri, where traffic had been reduced down to one lane. A drunken driver struck their car head on and both Ira and Anne were killed instantly. And I think there were also multiple other people in the car. This definitely before seatbelts. Really sad. Ira had just finished recording that record three months earlier. So that, after the car crash, was released posthumously. Ira's 1965 album, which was released posthumously, was called The Unforgettable Ira Leuven. (laughs) Um, And it featured electric mandolin and electric guitar. Uh, He's going back to his mandolin after Ken doesn't have a say anymore. And this turned out to be his only solo LP, His daughter, Kathy, said, Daddy was a bit of a tormented soul. He had these intense dreams. I remember he would get up at night and draw what he had dreamed. He would often dream of seven-headed monsters and proverbial hellfire and brimstone. There is something wrong with Ira. Um, And he, they had a really rough childhood, as you can imagine, growing up in the Appalachians on a cotton farm. Um, The dad was very strict. Life was brutal. Ira was very troubled. There's a lot more to know about these two brothers and their career. And even the era around when this album was recorded, there's a whole last book about it. And it's uh, by Benjamin Whitmer, co-authored it with Charlie. And it's called Satan is Real, The Ballad of the Leuven Brothers. Charlie Leuven died in 2011. And Whitmer said, I tried to get Charlie to explain why the gospel work seemed so dark and terrifying. He said he didn't think of the Leuven Brothers gospel much as dark at all. It was just about choices. Either you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. And there's no scary, there's nothing scary about that because the choice is up to you. Amen. (laughs) Nothing like good old binary thinking. Nothing is nuanced, huh? Yeah, so unfortunately morals are relative and that's an interesting take. But anyway, it's also kind of a, a posthumous Ira burn, I feel like. So the book itself is Charlie's memoir, uh, mainly about his time with his brother Ira during the Leuven brothers years. And there's a little bit about his own life after that. Yeah. So in Satan is real between verses, Ira preaches that to believe in God's grace is to also accept the devil's pull. That's pretty much it. I mean, the whole thing is creepy. Thanks for tuning in everyone. Don't worship the devil or do, I don't know, but take care of yourself. Take care, brush your hair, be nice to other people. Life is brutal enough. Count your blessings. Demons are real. They are standing still. That's a song lyric. Subscribe wherever you found me. Leave a five star. Leave five scars. (laughs) Leave a five star iTunes review. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time in hell. Bye-bye.